characteristics. If I should suddenly announce that I've got a mystery guest in the audience tonight, and I want you to guess who it is, you wouldn't have a clue. But if I started giving you indicators, and I said, all right, they're wearing red. Well, that starts to narrow it down, doesn't it? And people are looking around for anyone wearing red right now. <laughs> I'm just making this up. Don't take me so serious. And then I said, and they got one glass eye. Well, then it becomes even, you know, I got a patch over there. The more indicators I give you, the easier it gets to identify who that person is. And if I give you 10 obvious indicators, well, you know without a doubt, right? It's that much evidence. We're going to look at the evidence point by point. Question number five. This beast arises from the sea. What does the sea or water symbolize in prophecy? Do we need to make a spiritual guess or does the Bible tell us how to interpret prophecy? The symbols are explained in the Bible. It says the waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The papacy or the Catholic Church, it arose from existing centers of population. It did not come up in some obscure corner of the globe. Matter of fact, it came up right in the very location that was the seat of government for the then existing empire of Rome. So it fits the first criteria. It came up among the waters, multitudes of peoples, nations, and tongues, right in the middle. Question number six, who gives the beast its power and position? Remember we learned one characteristic, it receives its power and seat from the dragon. Revelation 13, two, and the? Dragon. Who's the dragon? Well, the dragon is the devil, but you read Revelation 12, and the dragon is the devil first working through Rome. I'll get to that in a moment. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Because Revelation is the last book in the Bible, to see the fulfillment of Revelation, obviously we need to go forward into history. Does that make sense to you? So you're going to notice that we are looking at some of the historical records to see the fulfillment of these last prophecies in Revelation. You have to do that. You can't go back in history to see future predictions. And so I want to explain none of the quotes or the references that you're seeing are from me or from my church. They're all from authentic historical sources or they're from the papacy themselves. We're trying to be as fair as possible. You know, in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon is the Roman power or the devil operating through the Roman power to eat the man-child as soon as he's born. Remember the Roman soldiers went to Bethlehem to kill baby Jesus. Herod wanted to destroy him, a Roman king. He was a vassal under Rome. But the devil works through. It's the dragon working through these governments. So the dragon giving the seat is the devil working through Rome, giving its office to the beast, its authority. Now this is what history tells us happened. And you'll find that it fits the first point here. The dragon gave its power, seat, and authority to the papacy. Let's review a little history quickly. You know that immediately after the time of Christ, there was a great persecution among the Christians. Then gradually, things began to change politically. Rome began to disintegrate because the barbarians and the Huns and everybody was attacking. Constantine even moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, and he was the first emperor who legalized the Christian religion. He said, they're not hurting anybody and we're tearing the kingdom apart fighting Christians when the real enemy is out there. These Germanic tribes are attacking us from the north. So he legalized Christianity and it became very in vogue because Constantine said, a matter of fact, I've been converted. He claimed to have a vision where he was to conquer under the sign of the cross. And to show how sincere he was, he ordered his whole army to march through the Tiber River. And he said, guess what? You've all been baptized. You're Christians now. Well, that caused all kinds of problems because all of these Roman pagan soldiers marched through the river and then they said, now you're Christians. They brought all their paganism into the church and it's never completely come out. And so you've got the commingling of these two religions. So he legalized Christianity and he then made it acceptable. He made it popular and prominent. You can read in the history records what then happened. It tells us the transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. And at the time, one might have predicted her speedy decline. But the development of the church and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome, or the pope, gave her a new lease on life and made her again the capital. This time, the religious capital of the civilized world. So you see, the Catholic Church quite literally received its authority, its seat, and its position, its power from Rome, from that first beast there. 
The beast receives its authority and its seat from Rome. You could also read in the history books, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs, or the popes in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff, to the pope. And it didn't happen exactly right then with um, Constantine. It became more official a couple of hundred years later. But basically, the power of the church began to grow there in Rome. Number seven, how far-reaching is the influence of the beast? Well, the Bible tells us, and all the world wondered after the beast. You know what the word Catholic means? Catholic means universal. And it was to be a universal worldwide power, and I don't think anybody is going to contest that. All authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's a universal power, and it meets that criteria. Need to give you a little more history now. As Christianity became the government religion, the religious leaders, in order to sort of centralize control, discovered that it wasn't safe to allow the people to read the Bible in their own language. They said, you're not educated, you're ignorant, and we think that the Bible should be kept in the sacred language of the empire. Well, you'd think that'd be Hebrew or at least Greek language of the New Testament, but they said it was Latin. Jesus didn't speak Latin. Or the apostles, they spoke Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. And so they then took the Bibles out of the hands of the people. Matter of fact, I'm going to read you a quote that may shock some of you. In the book, Index of Forbidden Books of Pope Pius IV, he says this, The Bible in the vernacular of the people, permitted generally without discrimination, will cause more damage than advantage because of the boldness of man. The judgment of the bishops and inquisitors is to serve as guides in this matter. If someone was found in possession of one of these Bibles, you know what that means? A Bible in the language the common people could read? They said, that's not safe. We'll read it. We'll tell you what it says. Because the people were saying, now, wait a second. The government church is teaching things that aren't in the Bible. And they said, be quiet. We're in charge. And there were a lot of very sincere people that lost their lives because they protested against what was happening here. But they took the Bibles out of the hands of the people. If someone was found in possession of one of these Bibles, this is from their own writing, without written permission from a priest or inquisitor, their sins cannot be forgiven unless they turn the manuscripts in and confess. You know why the Dark Ages are called the Dark Ages? Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And they took the Bibles away from the people. And that's one way that they entered into the Dark Ages. Question number eight. What comes out of the mouth of the beast? It tells you there, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. Now we need to find out what is blasphemy. There's another scripture here that you can read in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, speaking of the Antichrist power, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, friends, some people think that uh, they're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. I don't believe that. I think that this, and this is the only prophecy they use for that. Don't you remember where Paul says, what, don't you know that ye collectively are the temple of God? And so this power sitting over the temple of God doesn't mean he's sitting in a literal marble building somewhere calling himself God. It means he's sitting over the people of God, putting himself in the position of God. That's one of the definitions of blasphemy. Let's let the Bible define blasphemy for us. You remember when the Jews wanted to stone him? And the Jews answered and said to Jesus, For a good work we do not stone you. But for what? Blasphemy. For blasphemy. And because you being a man make yourself God. When a man puts himself in the place of God, that's a Bible definition for blasphemy. This is from Pope Leo XIII. This is what the Pope says. And incidentally, the Popes used to claim infallibility. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. I think that's a very arrogant thing for a human mortal to say, uh, with all due respect. Now, there are some other definitions for blasphemy you find in the Bible. Remember, the scribes again wanted to stone Christ. And the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So... For a man, biblically, to claim the right to be able to forgive sins is called blasphemy. And they were right about that. They were wrong because Christ was God. God the Son, and He had the right to forgive sin. 
Let's find out if the Catholic Church meets this definition that we've looked at.